And we are live. Great. And hello, hello to wonderful literary agent, Leslie Zampetti. Hello, Mel. It's great to be here. It's great to be, uh, I, I would rather be there, I think, with the war that's going on in Israel. Um, but where is there? Any place is, is, uh, is better than here right now. Well, right now I am in Philadelphia, um, which is where I lived after a uh, fair amount of time in New York and Manhattan. Um, and yes, uh, we are sincerely hoping that we can have peace uh, going forward. Yes, and there's a small chance we'll have an air raid siren, um, in which case I'll be gone for 10 minutes, but I'll be back. And we haven't had sirens lately. So um, let's hope we can have a a, a peaceful a, um, a talk amid the maelstrom that's uh, going on in the region. Uh, Leslie, so so great. I, I'm I'm so happy to meet you. And uh, you have a new literary agency. Uh, tell us about it. Tell us what you're looking for. Go ahead. Um, I opened my own agency. I launched it last fall. It is Open Book Literary. Um, I do represent both. Uh, kid lit authors, children's lit authors, and um, those who write for adults. Um, for adults, I'll be very brief. I'll just say that generally I represent historical book club or book club fiction, uh, also upmarket mysteries or romances. Uh, for children's lit, I have a slightly wider range. I represent picture books through YA, through young adult. Um, I have fairly wide ranging tastes, but as I tell people, one thing that is overarching for me, I was a former librarian, uh, starting for non-governmental organizations, consulting firms, corporate libraries. I moved through public libraries and then to school libraries. And so for me, especially when talking about kid lit, I'm looking for that sweet spot in the middle of the Venn diagram in which there are is immediate interest to the child reader or the young reader. And then at the same time, there is interest for the gatekeepers, parents, school librarians, educators, um, because I find that does give a much longer tail to the books and a longer life to them. And so what I'm looking for are books that hit that just beautiful sweet spot right in the middle. Okay, so um, I just had a wonderful librarian on the show last week, uh, Louise Laroe from the, she's the head of the, uh, New York Public Library for for children, yeah, and and um, so and, and and librarians and you have a past in all kinds of librarian functions, which is wonderful. Um, they have their own, you know, wishes. They wish that there were picture books that they could show to a group of kids, you know, with big fonts. They have different uh, different tastes. Well. Everybody has taste. That's one of the things that is a hard truth about publishing and reading is that it's incredibly subjective. Um, but I do believe that it can be inclusive, it can be open, and, you know, again, uh, Dr. Rudy and Sims Bishop, for a wonderful, wonderful quote about how books are not only um, windows, they are mirrors, and they are sliding glass doors that allow us to enter into others' thoughts, feelings, circumstances. Um, I just think there's something for everybody. And so uh, many times these days, people concentrate on being worried that publishing is shrinking, that children are reading less, that adults are reading less, and that there's not. And that I don't see that as true. Um, I also, you know, have a little bit of a business background as a librarian, and you see these large publishers, and they're making money. So obviously, publishing books is making money. People are buying books, and as everything in life, what goes up must come down. But what comes down must go up. That's uh, that's music to the ears of uh, of myself and my listeners. Um, so I, I I I was so excited to introduce you. I forgot to introduce me. So um, allow me, please. I'm Mel Rosenberg. I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network, which is why we're here. But we're here to talk about everything kid lit. Uh, you know, my my big uh, love is for picture books, but you can talk about middle grade and YA, and I might have some questions to ask you. Graphic novels and and what have you. Um, but tell us a little bit first about your background, uh, where you come from, your name, where you grew up, how you became enamored with, with children's books. So my name is Leslie Zampetti. Um, I often joke that I learned to read when I was three and never stopped. Other people have other hobbies. My hobby is still reading, even as an agent. Um, I grew up mostly in Florida, uh, in the U.S. I have lived a oh, widely, um, various places, mostly along the East Coast. Uh, and 
I actually became a librarian because I graduated with an English degree and needed a job. And my first class for my master's program, one of the professors asked everybody to raise their hand if you're here because you love books. And I did not because I did love books and I do love books, but I was there because I needed to get a job. And everybody but me and I think two other people raised their hands. And she looked out at all of us and announced, and this is a cataloging class, mind you, this is not a reference or public services class. All those of you who are here because you love books, you might want to go work at a bookstore. Libraries are about people and how people use books. And wow. I've that in mind ever since. My focus is on the reader. Uh, my focus is obviously on my clients as an agent, but also on that reader who's going to read the book eventually and why it's important. Um, I had a, a life as a librarian. I greatly enjoyed it. I moved through, as I mentioned, several iterations of librarianship from special libraries to public libraries to school libraries. Um, I also have written for many years. Um, I am not writing currently for publication, um, but after my daughter was born, I started, as many people do, to try and write picture books. Um, and I was very lucky to attend the Highlights uh, workshop in Chautauqua, uh, one of the last ones, and was mentored by Eric Roman, a very well-known picture book artist. And while I don't know that he would agree, um, he was really instrumental in me turning from my writing of picture books into writing other things. And around the same time, I was also attending a lot of other workshops and conferences, uh, primarily the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators in New Jersey. And um, an agent was there, I believe it was John Cusick, and was mingling, you know, as everybody does at these. And when he left the conversation, I was like, wow, that is a really interesting job. Agents have a lot of things that they do that that's really fascinating. And a published author who was already agent and looked at me and said, well, I'd be your client if you were an agent. And I thought that is so sweet. But then I went home and thought, <laughs> wait a minute, that's a really big compliment. This person is involved in this industry. They know what they're talking about. Maybe they have something here. And so I started thinking, what can I bring to the table? What would I need to learn? Um, and shortly thereafter, I was very fortunate um, to be able to, I had decided it was perhaps time to move out of librarianship. Um, and I got an opportunity with Dunham Literary and Jenny Dunham to be her assistant. And a couple of years after that, I started representing my own clients. Incredible. So uh, you told me in our uh, secret uh, talk before going uh, live that you represent, that you're looking for new clients. I which am. is I which is fun. wonderful, which is a good reason to be here. Um, and um, but you also have a lot of clients, which means that you are a hard worker. Um, I am a hard worker. I wouldn't say I have a lot of clients. I actually have a fairly small list. Um, I keep it that way on purpose. I believe that all of my clients deserve a lot of very individual attention. So Leslie, I'm going to I'm going to ask you. Um, you can say cucumber or avocado. Uh, what is a small list? So for me, a small list right now is 13. Um, I am not looking to expand probably much beyond 20. Um, and that might even be a little more than I would normally say, um, simply because, you know, I am a solo practitioner. It's me, myself, and I. Um, and so having the business, having the client work, dealing with the administrative work, and then responding to both events such as this and also people who query. Um, I believe all but perhaps one of my clients have come through my slush file. So I take my query manager very seriously. Um, I have to balance everything out um, because I do not, as much as I love this work, I do not want to be doing it 24-7. <laughs> that, that, that's a small list. That I mean, wonderful. I um, Wow. So... Um... In, in your new uh, literary agency, the Open Book Literary, literary yes. Agency, um, which we are celebrating today, um, about how many queries do you get a, a, a day, a week? Um, well, you're, recently, you're not open right now. Well, I recently started a new process uh, starting in January. I noticed last year, thanks to social media, which is, again, a chore, but also useful, that many agents that I respect greatly um, as colleagues had started closing to queries except for one week a month. So they're open one week, usually the first week, and then they close because it means you process your queries much more effectively, much more efficiently. Folks aren't left wondering what happened, did you get it? Um, it also means you need to be responding and requesting and reading 
currently and not letting your TBR pile up, your TB red pile. Um, and I had noticed that my general response time that I give people when I make a full request had gone from three months to slowly three to four months, and then it became four to five months. Um, that's too long. That's too long for people to have to wait. Um, so in the interest of trying to move that down and balance, um, I closed to queries over the holidays, um, answered all my outstanding queries, finished a series of requests, made new requests. And I recently was open uh, for the first second week, actually, of January because of the holidays. Um, I will reopen again for the first full week of February. Did, did you get um, hundreds or thousands of uh, queries? Yeah, well, not thousands, thankfully, but I did get hundreds, um, certainly plenty. Um, a nice mix, I will say. It's always nice to have a, a good mix of different queries. And um, I will say that uh, one of the benefits of maintaining a smaller list is I've noticed over the years, the quality of my queries has continued to increase. It only gets better. Um, the number has slightly decreased um, from the time that I started when I was at Dunham, but I think that's okay. I, I'm a big believer in quality. No, when, when you when you you were at Dunham, you had these um, uh, these standard answers, you know, where uh, thank you um, as much as I enjoyed reading your your uh, book. It's not right for me. That doesn't mean you're not a um, an Einstein or Michelangelo. Uh, have a nice life. Um, it, it, it's clear to the authors that this rejection. Um, doesn't mean anything that, that the agent has even read the work. On the other hand, the agents I've spoken to get an average of 30 queries a day and they take only 0.1%. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, why do, you have, why, do you have to, why do you have to give these, these rejections? If you, know, if you don't hear from me within a month, I'm not interested. So there's two schools of thought on that. You know, um, one is what you've said, that agents are really busy. And if you don't hear from me, you don't hear from me and consider it close. Um, my school of thought is that I feel that it's better to have a response because then you know I got it. There was no mistake. It didn't go wandering into the vast world of the ethernet. You, you could do that. You could do that within seconds of submission, which many agents do. Hi, I've, re I've uh, yes. received your uh, submission. If I'm I interested, I'll get back to you. Have a nice life. Yeah, I have been responding much more quickly to queries. Um, some people are getting them within, again, days, some within hours, depending on what I'm responding to. Um, I also felt that it was not helping people. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. Obviously, everybody wants feedback on why. But the problem is, is there's a lot of reasons why. Very, I wouldn't say very rarely. Rarely is it really the quality of the work that I'm getting. I am seeing very high quality queries. People are doing their research. They are looking for things. Um, but more often, it's I have clients that already write that type of work. Um, you know, if there's something I know as, for example, if I'm seeing picture book biographies, I may say this is not a fit at this time because the market's a little saturated for that. But when it comes to actual like, critique of the work, for example, I feel that's not really helpful coming from me because if it's not for me, I'm not the agent for you. You need to have that critique from someone who believes in your work and is. No, no, I, I, it's okay. I don't think that agents, yeah, should uh, reject authors with a letter telling the author uh, why it's not a fit. On the other hand, I don't think I don't think I think it's a bit disingenuous to write a uh, an email. You know, although uh, I'm sure you're a wonderful uh, author, um, I didn't feel this book was right for me, and 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 you know that you're getting a a standard rejection. You know, press F thirteen, um, and um, I, I think that I, I don't know. Maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I think that a lot of authors would rather not get that standard rejection letter. Um, you know, either say I'll get back to you uh, if I'm interested, um, and then I know you've received the uh, the query, um, and I'm not going to get a a, uh, a pancake answer. Yeah. Well, honestly, I mean that may be a good third way. Um, I don't know because I, you know, I, I want to be. I mean, I want to be. I want to be your yeah. unpaid assistant going forward. So, I'm, okay, I'm suggesting. Um, I don't. I, so honestly, um, I, you know, don't know agents that do that. I do know agents who say on their websites or in their query manager, "If you don't hear from me, that's a no." But then huh. you still wonder, did they actually see that? Um, 
not, not if I got not if I got a notification. We received your yes, your submission. Get a notification. Um, um, let, 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 let's move on. These are little niceties right. that we can we can deal with afterwards. Um, yeah. it's just, it just it just interests me. Um, so um, you, on your website, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, you you express um an interest in books, but it, we have you now on the show. What are you looking for these days in particular? In particular. Um, well, I am definitely seeking young adult in particular. Um, I have more picture book clients and more middle grade clients. And I do encourage my clients to write across categories for age and genre. Um, and so some of my middle grade clients write picture books and some of my picture book clients write for adults and various things like that. Um, I will say right now, I am fairly full with picture book clients, but that doesn't mean I'm not always interested in others. Again, it comes down to the work. Um, I am interested in author illustrators. I do not currently have any of those on my list. I would like to. Um, that's very helpful. Okay. I will say right now, I am looking for books that have um, a, not just a fresh or a unique take on their world, but that convey that particularly with humor and positive energy and joy. Um, I have obviously a weakness for lyrical nonfiction, but I also have very lovely clients who are writing a lot of that. And um, there are two ways again to look at this. Some people say, well, if you have that and you're successful at selling it, for example, um, Kate Allen Fox's book, A Few Beautiful Minutes is just absolutely stunningly gorgeous and also a lovely uh, lyrical take on the complete solar eclipse and how to view it. Can, um, can you open open the book and? Uh, sure. and uh... I would love to. And um, Cavell, Cavell about it for yes. our, um, the audience that's Koa watching Lee us. Was the, uh, Koa Lee was the illustrator, and she did some absolutely amazing, beautifully wow. painterly, you know, art with just a very unique color palette for this book. Um, this one I particularly love because of the wildlife. I don't know if you can see there are large bunnies and there's this cricket right on the tree and it is still very much artistic but also fairly realistic looking so that's that's really beautiful so, so this uh, begs my my next question leslie mm -hmm. um i i had uh, melissa stewart on on the show talking about fiction and nonfiction. um yes. and but today and, and she's the first to admit this there's a whole gamut in between and betsy bird has also opened up the informational uh, fiction um yes is it? I mean, as a writer who is a scientist, that's where I want to be. You know, in in between, somewhere in between. Um, is oh. there a place for us? Very much quote, so. To, um, I would argue. To quote Stephen Sondheim, "Is there a place for us? Yes. Is there a place for us?" I would argue that very much so. I mean, one of the things that I'm most proud is a book that recently sold. It hasn't been announced yet, but when I was a school librarian, I had a second grader come to me, and he said very seriously. He wanted a true book about potions. Okay. Well, after we satisfied ourselves that he was in fact looking for nonfiction versus fiction, um, I asked him about magic. Absolutely not, Miss Leslie. Then we went on to cooking because what else could it be? And at this point, I'm getting the eye rolls. I am obviously not a very smart grown up. Um, and finally, and I don't know why I pulled this out. I said, are you looking for books about chemistry? Yes, we have a budding scientist. Well, the library did not have much. I said, well, I'm putting in a book order and I'll see what I can get for you. Well, what I could get was not very interesting. It was very dry. And it was definitely skewed towards an older audience. Um, and ever after I thought, you know, this is really disappointing. I was able to give him something. So he was a little happy with that, but he really wanted books that he saw much like, you know, what we see for things like 2000 Miles to Happy. It's a fictional biography of Earl Schaefer who did the first through walk of the Appalachian Trail. He wanted pictures and art and interesting did, things about chemistry. Leslie, did you call this a fictional biography? Um, it is true. It is based on fact, but she is actually entering into. No, I, I, no, I, I don't apologize. I love yeah. that. So Fictional I think there's more to it than just the usual, because we get biographies I, of just the facts, ma'am, and then no, we get Leslie, one. I, I love it. Yeah, I so. love it. I like fictional biography, I, I, and I'm not like I'm. I'm an ex-scientist who writes now for children, 
So um, maybe you'll interview me someday on that. But um, but cer certainly it's it's a really interesting topic. And very often I will find picture books that are written on science by non-scientists, and I have to bite my whatever. That is something that I keep in mind. So two of my clients are scientists and have been involved um, in science for a long time, one of whom we just sold. She wrote a picture book mystery about the periodic table. It is fabulous. Whoa. I want to interview her. Yes, I will make a note of that. What What's her um, name? When When is the book out? Is it is Sarah Glower? Um, and we are in the midst of finding out when that will be. Um, it's in the process of being edited. And by I, New I York. love it. I love it. So, send yes, me it, all of those. Like, send me all of your authors who cross over between okay. fiction and nonfiction. Between, I, I love this fictional biography. It's great. You know, it's like a double life. Um, the life I didn't that. have. I love that. Um, and and so before we move on from from picture books, there's another thing I wanted to say, uh, mm -hmm. and that is that Louise Lero also stressed the role of librarians mm -hmm. as people. People. It's not yes. just about the books; it's about the audience. And I think that that's that's incredible. Um, I, so any librarian worth their salt does that. <laughs> Yeah. So, so because I'm I'm a a picture book author who's not an illustrator, or let me put it this way, you would not want to see my illustrations of stick men. But I've spoken to many editors, and um, there is a place for picture book authors who are not illustrators, and you have some of them, but you don't have more than thirteen. Um, why are you Why are you closed to seeing picture book manuscripts oh i am not closed i mean i do still welcome that um i do still people send me picture book text only queries i do read them all very seriously i consider them because agenting is sort of like your birthday every day when you go into your query box you never know what you're going to find you have to open each one and it could be wonderful. It could be just a lovely birthday present of a story or sometimes it's like the socks someone gave you that are very practical, um, but not something you need right now because you have lots of those. And sometimes it's like the person that you thought knew you so well and they give you this gift mm -hmm. that you just are astounded by and not necessarily in the best way. That's pretty rare. So, so um, this is this is a great analogy. I, and, and I've interviewed many agents, but I've, I've never had this analogy. Um, so it's it's like a a birthday or a chocolate box or whatever. Exactly. Uh, but you have other chocolate boxes around the house, and you ever already have enough marzipans. That doesn't yeah. mean that you don't love marzipans. No, but if all you ate was marzipan, you would soon be a little bilious maybe a little green around the gills stick to your stomach because it is super sweet. But yes, that doesn't mean you don't love it. There, there, sometimes there's, you there, there, up yourself and you, you eat an extra piece, even though you know you shouldn't. Yeah, I, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a children's book waiting to be written on the one, one millionth marzipan. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Will it be green marzipan or just the white marzipan? It depends who's writing it. Okay. If I'm talking about it, then I'm not going to write it, you see, because people are listening. If I get an idea during the interview that's really a really good one, I have a piece of paper here where I write you're my gonna ideas. You're going to save it. And I don't share them. There you go. Okay. Um, and you're also looking for young uh, adults. A few yes, words I... about that. And, and, and time to brag about the books on the shelf. So... Obviously, my my client books are primarily behind me. Um, I'm exceptionally proud of Wendy Cross's. Um, then there was one. It is a YA mystery. We pitched it as Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, mixed with the reality TV show Survivor. Um, it is very much a seat of the pants page turner. And the, I have to show you again, because it's so lovely. I don't think it comes through. There's gold foil on the cover. And it's just so pretty. Um, but it also brings up larger questions of justice. Who deserves justice? Who is entitled to give justice? Um, how do we look at these things? And I love the fact that maybe it brings up those questions for people who wouldn't be comfortable, um, especially teens who maybe are like, I'm not interested in thinking about that right now, but 
as they're reading this book, it's kind of implanting that seed. It's giving them something to go on as they go forward. And that sort of brings us back to the whole, is it a window? Is it a mirror? Is it a sliding glass door? Is it enlarging our world rather than narrowing it? So um, what, when you unwrap your chocolate box tomorrow morning mm -hmm. and you find that delicious non-marzipan, informational marzipan or whatever, the fictional biography of a marzipan, or what used to be a marzipan or what will be, but it's actually cherry, cherry chocolate, which okay. is your great love. Um, but you know that you can't eat it yet because you have to nail down the author, you have to edit, you have to look for the publisher, yada, yada, yada. When is your Leslie Zampetti moment where you where where that's the moment that you eat the cherry covered chocolate? So for me, part of what I see about the query box is, you know, a lot of agents talk about it like it's an immediate decision. You fall in love with the work and you have to have it. That is true to some extent, but there are also plenty of things that come from my query box that I can see there is a really good idea here. I can also see that the author needs to work on their art and their craft some more. Um, Andrea is a very good example of that. My client, Andrea Shapiro, she wrote 2000 Miles to Happy. Um, and I actually was in conversation with her through my query box for almost two years before I signed her. And I kept inviting her to continue to query me. She kept sending me queries for this and other similar books um, that were also very appealing. Um, and at one point she came to me and said, well, I think I'm about to break through. I may have an offer for publication, which was somewhat appealing, but I also could see, and when I looked at it, I went back and reread all of her prior queries because I do archive them, I keep them. And I could see how much work she had done and this whole arc of how she had grown as an author. And I was like, you know what, I, I need to have this person. I think we're ready to take that leap. Um, some people may need a little less time, or I may say, well, we can work together while this book is on sub. Um, sometimes you have clients that you just know or potential clients that you know they're gonna be a really good fit for a particular imprint or editor. And you are, going to take that chance and you say I'm going to take this on it's not quite there but I think we can get it there very soon every client's journey is different um, some take longer some take shorter the industry is always changing editors come they go trends come and go and while I don't believe authors should write to trends because again what goes up comes down what goes down comes up um, you know it's, it's really being an agent is being in kind of a wonderful position where you're looking at a larger landscape and you're sort of seeing, well, what is happening overall? I'm not just looking at the weather right where I'm sitting or the weather right where it is at New York, say. I want to see what's happening in the South and the North and the East and the West and see where there might be opportunities and what do I want to work with? Um, I also look at my client list. You know, do I have too much of one thing? like the marzipan, do I need something to shake it up? Do I need a dark chocolate covered almond who is really going to revitalize what we're all doing? You know, because... The question is, okay, so I mean, like for, for the author, the mm -hmm. moment that they get representation or a, a publishing deal, they get to eat their chocolate. Yes. Where, at what moment is oh. your chocolate eating moment? I think it's a series of bites. So the first bite for me is finding that manuscript in my query box. And the second little bite is when the author says yes to me, because let's be very frank, everybody talks about how agents reject authors. Well, authors reject agents all the time. And so do editors. So we have to have really thick skin because everybody's telling you no. And worse, just like you were talking about the sort of form rejection that we send authors, we're getting it from both sides. You're really great. And I really loved talking to you, but I've decided to go with agent X over here at agency Z. Okay, great. <laughs> you know, what do you do about that? I still love that author. I still want to, you know, cheer from them from the sidelines. Um, it goes on again. You have another chance at a bite when the client not only had said yes, but their stuff is going out on sub and you have that moment where it's going to people who are excited to hear about it. Um, and so that moment when an editor says yes and sends you an author is another bite. 
And then when you successfully negotiate the contract for your author, and I would say that last bite is when the book actually comes out and you can hold it in your hand, you see it in libraries and stores. And for me, when you see readers enjoying it, um, for me, that's one of the few things I really love about social media is being able to see when other people are enjoying my clients' work, um, authors I know, colleagues, because uh, there are agents who write as well. They're really enjoying these books that we're working so hard to create. That's probably the final last licking my fingers bit of the chocolate for me. <laughs> okay, this is this is wonderful. Um, and so, but you've given up the chocolate box of Leslie, the the author. So for the time, I still write for myself, and I think that's fine. I'm happy with that. Um, when I get to a point where either I have more time, more energy, or I have an idea that I see as a story that I don't think has been told, or it needs my perspective, then I will gladly seek publication. But right now, I look at the stories that I've written, and I think they're well written, and I'm very happy with them. But I also see other people out there writing similar stories. And I think they're doing a better job right now. So I'm going to leave that to them and make room for that. I'm not so sure. You know, we're not always good judges of our own writing. We are not always ju good judges of our own writing, but I find a tremendous satisfaction and fulfillment in using a large part of my creative energy with my clients um, in discussions like this, in the workshops that I am faculty for, uh, the you know conference sessions that I speak at. And right now that's good. And I think sometimes you have to know your limits and sometimes you need to stretch them. And right now we're in a knowing the limits section. I'm not saying I will never stretch them, but we'll see. Okay, so you're interested in getting more a uh, young adult in your query box. Yes. Um, and you will tolerate picture book uh, authors who aren't illustrators. I do not say I tolerate them. I welcome them. They just should be aware that the odds are a little smaller than they were before. Leslie, the odds are a thousand to one, let's face it. Uh, yes. the, odds the odds are very, the odds are really high, but people do achieve them. And, you know, there's a lot of complaining right now that I hear, um, again, mostly from social media about how there just seem to be, well, from the agent side, there are more agents, there's more competition, but I think that's a good thing because again, it is so subjective and another agent who comes along, who's even newer than I am may see something in work that I didn't see, or they may have a connection where they believe they can sell something. And I think that's something that a lot of authors forget is it's not just about whether or not we love your work, it's whether we think we can sell it at that time. And part of growing as an agent is knowing where you're successful and seeing what you're successful at. And that does okay. change. So it's, not, it's not about the market, it's what Leslie's good at selling, which makes yes, a lot of sense to a me. Lot of it, yes. I mean, the market plays into that, but it also plays into, well, you know, okay. how, am I, the, 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 how am I succeeding in that market? Yeah, you see how excited I'm getting? That means it's a good interview. Um, oh, good. Because, because I'm always I'm always thinking about, you know, an agent look at it and, and, and whether or not they want to, they are pigeonholing a story, um, not necessarily the way the author is pigeonholed. Who can I sell this to? Oh, um, it's a Hanukkah story. But if it was a, a Purim or a Passover story, maybe I could sell it. I know somebody who's looking for a Passover story um, or yes. a, 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 and so on. Um, the reason I'm asking this is because when when people go to buy, let's say, picture books, because I really don't understand other genres very well, um, even so. So here I'm going to say something I've never said it before, but I I trust that you, you'll you'll be kind. Um one in a thousand picture book authors gets a, a traditional publishing deal. Yeah. And then you would expect that every book that's traditionally published, every picture book is going to be, wow. Wow, it's going to be another where the wild things are because it's like one in a thousand. And it, it, it's the chosen of the chosen of the chosen. And people go to a bookstore and they come back and they say, you know, I didn't see very much really awesome stuff. Have you ever heard that before? So I think the problem is, is not only people sometimes forget that we are, as authors, we're not only competing with what is published today, we are competing with the backlist. And for picture books in particular, there is a very rich backlist. And those books are very well on their way. 
But I think attitudes are changing. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it has to do with how picture books are marketed. You know, are they marketed to particular events? Are they marketed to, you know, can, again, it's that sweet spot of, will this be something that is relevant right now? Will it continue to be relevant long term? Mm -hmm. um, we say that Leslie, you're, you're, Leslie, you're being too kind here. I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, right? So I, yeah. I, w whether or not I want to, I, I'm, I'm interested in Jewish books, Hanukkah books, and, yeah. and 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 I see a lot of Hanukkah books that are really not really very good picture books, and I, I can see why people thought there would be a market for another Hanukkah book about the the dreidel that got dizzy spinning and had to go to the doctor, or whatever. Um, and, and and when you when you write for a market, when you sell for a market, does it impinge on the quality of the books? So I think that really depends. So there's a difference between somebody saying, I am going to write a Hanukkah book because I don't see this particular Hanukkah book in the market, or publisher B has a Hanukkah book that did well. We think we can do well with this Hanukkah book. And things that what I try to do for my clients, um, I'm also Jewish. I'm I am reconstructionist, and how are you? One thing you, you you're Jewish. I am Jewish. Zampetti because... is my married name. <laughs> okay, no, there's nothing wrong. With, nothing wrong with that. But <clears throat> um, we've been talking for thirty eight minutes, and um, you're really Jewish. What is what was your maiden name? Um, would you believe Wood? Leslie Wood. Yes. Okay, I mean, my it's wonderful that you... my father's yeah. not, but my father very much insisted that we be brought up um, as Jews, and so we were, although maybe not as conventionally as most. No, people. I, Re reconstructionism is wonderful. It's not the subject of our discussion today, but we can have another talk about that. Um, to that, but but, 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 but you, that, you know you know what you know what I you know what I mean. Yes, but part of what I was trying to say is that. Oftentimes, and this may be a personal preference, um, I think one thing that is valuable is looking for books that speak to Jewish values in a way that are not necessarily pigeonholing it, or that's a Jewish book, we're gonna put it here. It only goes to these publishers. And it's very interesting. Um, I meet with editors all the time who tell me, even though they themselves are not Jewish, even though they are not at Jewish imprints, they are looking for books that have those values. Sometimes they specifically say, I am looking for Jewish books about X. Sometimes they just say, well, I'm really looking for books that talk about making the world a better place. And to me, that what that says is, okay, I, this is someone I can submit books about ticking along to. They may not call it that, but they understand what it is. And so just like we see for black authors, just like we see for Latinx authors, Jewish authors, um, it's more about getting people to look at things outside of the silos and who is interested in this book and what does it mean to them. So, uh, so can, can you tell me that when you look at a book, mm -hmm. and I, again, I, I'm going to go back to pictures, books. When, when, when somebody sends you a manuscript that's not illustrated and maybe it still needs a lot of work and maybe the holiday has to change and maybe the main character, uh, character is not an armadillo, it's an avocado, um, are you able to, and how do you do this? Are you able to see 20,000 miles in the distance to see the finished book? That's when you know it's the right book for you. That's the spark, is if you can see that. Maybe you can't quite see the finished book because you don't know what magic the illustrator and the editor and those others who collaborate will bring to the project, but you have an idea. And so for me, that is also why I rarely offer very specific feedback, even for rejections on full manuscripts, because if I haven't been able to see that, I'm not the right person. And if I'm not the right person, maybe I'm harming what you're working on by giving you feedback, because there is likely another agent out there that sees what you see and is going to have that spark for you and is going to say, yes, this character needs to be an avocado. Where I was like, well, you know, an avocado, maybe it really should have been a blueberry. Well, that's not gonna work for your story. It needs to be an avocado, but I couldn't see it because of my own perspective. And that's at once the wonderful thing and the most frustrating thing about this job, because there are many, many queries that I pass on that I am, it is a perfectly good story. 
if it were in published form, I probably would have bought it for my library. You know, it's something that I know people will want, but it is not speaking to me the same way. And like you said, I don't see that end result. I don't see that book. No, but that, um, that's very that's very encouraging that um, because many writers think that um, literary agents are just in it for the money. Uh, they just want to make as much uh, percentage, and um, and I I try I keep try I keep trying to explain that there's other ways to make money. <laughs> well, in this and the world. Part, so this is something for your your listeners and you know those viewing this interview who may not know. Number one, uh, agents who represent primarily children's lit very rarely make a lot of money. Those who are very good can make a living. But trust me, especially for picture book author only texts, you are usually not getting the kind of money that will enable this kind of. You know, I, I think I think I think that for picture book texts, you need to get more than fifteen percent, and I've said this repeatedly. What what is a normal picture book deal? Well, a there is none because again, that depends on the author. Are they experienced? Leslie, give me a number. Story, Just give me a number. I, I um, know that. Give me a number. A good advance, what I think no, is a, I, 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 no, like not a, a good very advance. good advance. No, no, a, an advance, not a very good and not a very poor. Uh, in Israel, um, a, there's no advance. You just get the royalties. Oh. Um, and we don't have agents because it's a small country. And probably most small countries don't have. Um, but um, just give me a regular amount, a ball game. You like baseball? Give me a ball game figure. I do love I do love ballpark figures, but this one's really hard because again, who are you selling it to? Um, Leslie, not, just give, give me give me a number, dear. No, <laughs> I'm really not going to do that because there's too much uh, more that goes into the deal. This is one thing again. If I a good contract is not always about the money. Sometimes a good contract is about what is the publisher going to do for you in terms of your editor. Are you going to keep your rights? Um, are they, these days, are they letting AI use your work? You know, what is going to do? Do you have consultation over the illustrator or do you have approval over the illustrator? There are a lot of things that go into what is a very- That's Okay, uh, okay, but you know, we're, we're, we're cucumbering the question. Um, if I'm, okay, <laughs> if, if, I'm a, if I'm a debut writer in, uh, in the States and I've sold to a moderately decent publisher, um, and most books do not earn out the advance. Uh, would if, if I receive five thousand dollars, would that be okay as an advance for a writer? That would be, I would say, fairly generous. That would be like a yes. thing. So. Yes, and, and but of the five thousand dollars, you want to tell me that after all the work you've done, gone through thirty manuscripts today to look for the chocolate in a million, and 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 help me edit and 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 change the armadillo to avocado into Armageddon and back to whatever, and sold it. And you get $750? Maybe, if you're lucky. So, now, so to, to this, everybody who's this, listening- this secret, they're, though. They're, they're looking at that 15%. So in the States, unless the illustrator is an author illustrator, um, we are, all, you know, you're getting the 15%, but, you know, royalties are split between the author and the illustrator. So it does get smaller. No, the, the illustrator yeah. can get $20,000. $20, yeah, nobody is in this for the money. Um, but the other thing that you have to think about is um, people who go into agenting often do so because they have skills that lend themselves to the job. Some people come in because they are writers and they've made connections. Usually they're, again, much like librarians, they tend to be people people. They may be somewhat introverted. Um, but at the same time, you're able to work with many different types of people. You're able to not only appreciate the art and craft of writing, but the business part of it. Um, what I was going to say though, the dirty secret that many people do not always know is that many agents have day jobs. Agenting is not what they do to earn their bread and their rent. Do you have a day job? I, love it. I personally am very privileged. I do not have a day job. I am very lucky okay. to be able to do this. This, so. this is, Leslie, we, we have to we have to start. And I, I'm going to invite you again in six months, whether you like it or not, uh, because okay. so many so many things we didn't we didn't touch upon. Um, and my last question, sure. uh, before we go off and come back to have our tete a tete, 
uh, yeah. which nobody's going to know about except us, is very briefly, uh, are query letters important for picture book writers? Because you can read the story faster than you can read the query letter. So I read both because I read both for different reasons. One, I want to read the query letter to see how the author talks about their book. More importantly, I'm reading it for clues to this person because it's not just all about the book, it's also about the person. This is a partnership, we are partnering together. So I have to be a good partner to you and I would like you to be a good partner to me. And so sometimes that is great and sometimes not so much. Um, I wanna say I was maybe two years into representing my clients, maybe a year, year and a half. And I offered for a picture book that I liked very much but it was also very obviously on the call that for whatever reason, we were not clicking as personalities. And that's perfectly fine. That's why you have the calls. Um, I very much still liked the author. It was apparent that the author was probably not as enamored of me and that's okay. Um, you know, again, it's a partnership. And so for me, the query letter oh. is, how do you communicate outside of your stories? And that's beautiful. So, so what? So it's the query letter. It's not the techniques of whether you talk about yourself in the third person or what first person or second person. You you want to give the agent a feel of who you are. Yeah, that's just, beautiful. Just that's a taste. beautiful. We're we're gonna stop at this high, um, and I'm gonna thank you, Leslie Zampetti, um, for this excellent and exciting uh, interview. Uh, and I am Mel Rosenberg. You're very welcome. The, yeah, and I, what am I? I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I've been speaking with the wonderful Leslie Zampetti, who is an agent with her new company called Open Book Literary. And she will be open for submissions on February the 4th or 5th. First full and week of February. Submit and tell her that you saw this interview. It can't hurt. Can it no. hurt? No, it can't. And, and Leslie, you and I will be back in a minute and a half. Leave and come back. And to everybody else, have a wonderful week. Great. Thank you. No, no. Do you want to record this? No, I don't want to stream live on Facebook either. Hold on a second. Stop.